Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. My name is Molly Buckley Marudis, and I'm here with the rest of the Cleveland Teaching Collaborative team for the first ever uh, CTC Summer Sandbox. And this afternoon, we have a really um, great session planned for you with three of our CSU colleagues, um, Diane Corrigan, Grace Wong, and Carmen Alicia. And the title of their session is Developing and Delivering a Successful Virtual Symposium. All of the sessions will be available afterwards on our resource refer referatory. Um, so at this point, I will turn it over to the presenters. Thank you, Molly. Um, as Molly mentioned, the title of our presentation is Developing and Delivering a Successful Virtual Symposium. And this symposium occurred last April, and it was the culminating event for our action research project. So we're happy to share some details about the project, along with much information about that virtual symposium. Um, as Molly mentioned, um, we are Cleveland State colleagues who are presenting. Um, I'm Diane Corrigan. I'm a uh, clinical associate professor in the Department of Curriculum and Foundations and coordinator of the Master of Urban Secondary Teaching Program. Um, Grace Wong, um, Dr. Grace Wong is a professor in the Department of Teacher Education at Cleveland State. And Carmen Alicia is a recent graduate of the Master of Urban Secondary Teaching Program who participated in an action research project and the symposium. So welcome. All right, so uh, thanks Diane for the introduction. Uh, first, I would like to share with you about our CSU Action Research Program. We started about eight years ago. Uh, it was 2013. And this program really is a partnership between the CSU faculty and the K-12 practitioners. And the major goal like on the slides is to provide the practitioners uh, what we call in the visualized professional development using the action research approach. So what we did was we team up our CSU faculty who came from all different colleges, not just education, but also business college, liberal art college, and with the practitioners. And they could be teachers, teaching aides, they could be psychologists, they could be principals. And together they conduct action research. And what's special about this program is the topic itself, the project itself was chosen by K-12 practitioners. So that's something authentic and meaningful to them. So each project runs for less than one academic year, but that's how we run uh, the cycle. And there are three phases for this program. And um, the very last phase is symposium. And this is the time for the research team for them to showcase their projects face to face. So as you could see here in the, uh, in the picture on the left hand side, this is our traditional symposium that we run in College of Education. So what presenter have is they have their um, choice of presenting poster board, uh, trifle board, or if they want to use a laptop to provide projection, they could do that too. And the essence is they are able to have one-on-one -on -one interaction with attendees uh, through orally informal presenting, articulating their projects. And every year we have about 100 to 130 people who come during the air hours of like two hours and people come and go. So it's very flexible. So now because of pandemic, we need to go virtual. And for us, we want to maintain, you know, the goal of being interactive and, but at the same time, technology, the friendly atmosphere for the presenters. So we need to be very mindful about the structure that we set up. We try to be flexible so the presenter, they can interact with attendees. So we decided to provide options for our presenters to um, to have a choice and which Diane is going to talk about the choices. Diane? Um, as Grace mentioned, we moved from a face-to-face -to, -face to a virtual symposium um, and tried to keep the key components of that symposium. First of all, it's a celebration of the work of our researchers, that year-long projects that they had 
completed or were in progress um, definitely needed to be shared with a wider audience. So they could not only receive feedback, but these projects could be rec replicated. So we definitely needed a symposium and we had the option of a virtual symposium and we chose the Zoom platform. Um, there were a number of platforms being used at Cleveland State and other institutions, but we thought that persons were most familiar with Zoom, at least the persons in our audience and in our presenters. So as Grace mentioned, we needed to consider the comfort level and the expertise of the participants. So we chose um, the Zoom platform. We also felt that we needed options for presentations because this is virtual. Um, in the face-to-face -face format, people could ask questions to the presenters. They could move on to another presenter, perhaps after a very short conversation or after a long conversation. They could return to a presenter that was of particular interest to them. Um, and they could be selective um, whose research they wanted to learn more about during these presentations. So we needed to see how can we offer all of these options and meet all of these needs in a virtual environment, while being aware that we had a larger, maybe not in number, but a larger audience in terms of expertise and location that would be attending this symposium. It wasn't just our colleagues at Cleveland State or our partnering school districts and universities. This invitation was extended across the United States um, through our personal contacts, as well as professional organizations, was actually extended internationally. We didn't uh, achieve our goal of um, including international participants, but we did have participants from across the United States. I want to add one thing. Actually, my daughter from Germany, she participates. Oh. So we have one oh, from you, international. <laughs> that was good to know. Um, so, when we were offering the, um, the symposium, we knew that we would need assistance. We mentioned earlier that um, this was a learning curve for us and we had to learn quickly and we wanted to be experts if possible to add to the comfort level of our presenters and um, attendees. Our first resource was Chris Venison. Sorry, Chris Venison, who is the senior manager of our ISNT department at Cleveland State, and certainly the most helpful to us in giving us direction, skills, support. Um, we started with Chris, and we were very happy that he was with us till the very end of the symposium, um, actually present with us at the symposium. So that was most helpful. Um, we looked to our CSU students um, as a volunteer staff. We had graduate and undergraduate students who were currently enrolled in our licensure programs at Cleveland State. Um, and they brought with them um, knowledge of the action research process as well as knowledge of the um, programs that we were using, the technology that we needed. Um, they were highly skilled, highly motivated, um, very enthusiastic participants that offered persons help with chat rooms, attendance, um, breakout rooms, um, recordings. Um, it was a long list um, that we can thank our CSU students for in assisting with this symposium. And then we certainly included our CSU faculty members. In the past, um, they had the role of conversants, meaning they moved from presenter to presenter and asked questions, offered feedback, um, really engaged with our presenters. Um, responding to their particular questions and needs. Um, during the virtual symposium, we expanded that role. Um, we needed session, session chairs and discussants. Um, ses, session chairs, meaning that we needed persons to watch the time, to facilitate the movement, to um, help people with the any details that might need um, the work of our CSU students or perhaps Chris or our technology staff. But again, another very, um, very evident presence of support. Um, the discussions had the role of keeping the discussion going. Uh, we wanted deep discussions. This research uh, occurred over a year and our researchers were certainly committed to the process 
process as well as their students. So we asked the discussants to make sure the discussion was flowing, um, questions were answered, and feedback was provided. So to achieve all those goals and utilize all those skills from all the people, um, we needed to structure the symposium. The welcome and the closing were the easy parts. We could do that um, very quickly and smoothly. Um, but we needed to work out these breakout rooms. Um, that was the tool that we used to give people options for participation. Um, we wanted to give them the freedom to enter and leave any session at any time, just like in the physical presentation, they could move from one presenter to the next. We also recognized that one of the challenges of posed by the pandemic was that many persons did not complete their research project. The presenters were at very different stages in conducting this action research. So we wanted to give options that would provide them with the feedback and support that they needed at whichever stage they currently um, were at at the time of the symposium. And so the first one was the formal paper presentation. And we had a 60 minute time slot. We invited three to four presenters within this time slot. They had an eight to 10 minute PowerPoint presentation and then up to 10 minutes for question and answer. So these presenters had pretty much completed their action research. Um, they were disseminating their results, giving people ideas for their own research and getting feedback on where to go next. Um, a real plus of the virtual presentation was that they could provide a link to their PowerPoint that persons could go back to for specific information. Um, they offered a summary of highlights that persons can access. And of course, just like this session, it was recorded so persons could uh, hear the whole presentation again. The section, uh, second option was a Jamboard session. Um, we felt that we had seen our CSU students as, where, as well as teachers successfully using the Jamboard as a, a teaching tool. And we felt it offered an option that had a visual um, representation of the work along with the oral um, presentation. And there was a high level of interaction with the Jamboard. Um, persons who used this format were pretty much midway or a little farther beyond with their research. Um, they were getting feedback on what they had accomplished so far and ideas for going forward. Um, again, we used the 60 minute time slot. We put three to four presenters together um, to interact with the Jamboard and get as much feedback as they could. And since there were some specific challenges, first of all, introducing people to Jamboard who hadn't been familiar and then implementing it. So Grace is going to give some additional information. Okay, so uh, Jamboard. First, I want to share with you what Jamboard is like, and I think most of you here have used it before. So, but I'll just briefly talk about it. So it's a Google uh, platform that you use a Jamboard and it's interactive. So what you could do is you have a board here and then uh, the attendee, they can feel free to put sticky notes providing feedback. So I want to make my grand entrance to say hi, and this is what I could do to block the whole presentation. So this is what Jamboy is about, is to provide visual interactions. And uh, for our Jamboard, it's a tough one to prepare. And the reason is that we want it to be user-friendly during the operation, but we want it to be interactive, that uh, they can feel comfortable multitasking. So we had a long discussion with Chris, our technology experts, a long discussion, brainstorming what will be the best way to present. And finally, we think about, you know, traditionally the presentation is sharing screen and there's no interaction. Basically you listen and then look at the board, but we want more than that. So what we did was for an attendee, you will see two different windows. The left-hand side, you could see people are enjoying and Will is there too. 
<laughs> enjoying the uh, interaction orally and face to face, that type of interaction, eye contact is very important. But at the same time, we have the right hand side of the window that the attendee, they can not only read the board, but also work on the board. So two windows open is very important. We use a Zoom platform just for the video itself. Everybody can see each other. And I'm asking all the attendees, they have to open a separate link for the Jamboard to have visual interaction with the board. And so people can simultaneously write things on or whatever they want to provide the feedback, they could do that. So um, I think this is a plus, you know, we heard from uh, the feedback that it's adding more than just a traditional symposium, that it not only is the oral interaction, but also leaving the written feedback um, on the board for the presenters. Okay, Diane, back to you. Right, thanks, Grace. The third option were roundtable sessions. We had used roundtable sessions frequently throughout the year um, during this project um, outside of the pandemic and found them to be very productive and very helpful in offering feedback to our researchers. Um, this format was used by researchers who were still at early stages of the research. Research. So they were looking for direction, they were looking to see where other researchers were um, at in the process and feedback on where they were um, thus far. So there was limited presentation, but high levels of discussion during the roundtable discussions. Again, the 60 minute sessions, the three to four um, tables, but we wanted people to know that they could have the option to get assistance. Um, April was near the end of the school year, but many projects um, continue into the next school year um, with some, uh, some additions, some deletions, but um, maybe a very similar project going ahead next year. And as you noticed on these slides, there were very detailed information about these sessions. This is what was presented in our invitation to um, presenters and attendees. So they would know what choices they had and they could select the one that was the best fit for them and what they were hoping to find and receive um, and offer um, during the symposium. Okay, so we talk about the structure itself, but there are a lot more to prepare. And I'm sure Dr. Buckley, uh, Dr. Rose and Chris, you know all those. Um, and here we would like to highlight a few for you to think about if in the future you would like to do some conference type of presentation um, gathering. The first one is the Zoom platform uh, set up. And this part, I'm sure many of you here um, already familiar with this, but uh, for the recording, I would like to go through some of the things for people to pay attention to. And for the platform, if you look at the left hand side here, this is the basic schedule setup. On the bottom here, I would like to highlight some that is focusing on the conference setup. One is registration. And I think this is very important because then you can get the contact information and the name of uh, the attendees or potential attendees. And then the next one is the security. Security, the waiting room we would strongly recommend because you can have control over, especially in the beginning, um, that you are still chaotic trying to prepare and suddenly people jump in. Um, you don't want people to see that chaos, right? So having that control is very helpful. Um, and on the meeting options, um, I would like to uh, you to pay attention to the breakout room which is uh, like I, Diane say, that is the essence of the conference part of it. And for the breakout room set up on the bottom here specifically, uh, because our plan is when the attendee come in, we want them to be able to freely go one room to another. Because sometimes if you feel, mm, this is not right fit of what I'm looking for, you, then you want to go to room two or room three, or you decided just to hop out, that will be just fine. So you need to click 
specifically this one, let participants choose a room. And this is not a default. So for sure, making sure you choose this one. Um, another two area is recording. Recording, you can do it in the main room, but also in each breakout room, the people who attended there who were the alternative hosts, they can record also. And that's very critical. So that go down to alternative host. I would recommend that your team to have uh, people as many to be the host um, that you trust. And because sometime could uh, have something going on, the main host couldn't operate, then you have other people can step up. Step, uh, step up. All right, so uh, for a conference, you need to have program, right? So the program is very general. So I'll just mention what are the things, major things to include. One is the key agenda for the entire structure. And then another part is when attendee comes, you want them to think about, okay, what is the overall program structure like for all the different presentations? And also, if I'm interested in certain one, I want to be able to go into the detail of that specific presentation. So on the right top here, you will see it's a list of different room, what kind of presentations are there. And then on the bottom part is the detail program. For example, if I want to go to room one, who are there? Who are the session chair presenter? And then what's the abstracts? So these are the part we try to make it reader friendly and more options for uh, the attendees. Um, another thing that I cannot stress enough is rehearsals with the team. The more, the better, because we all use Zoom, but we are not comfortable with conference type because we probably never experienced before. And especially in the final rehearsals, a real run through is very critical. So not just oral instructions saying, oh, your A is going to do what? And where are you going to walk into later on? What time? But is to provide team the real action. So the team needs to pre uh, pretend they are the presenter. So what anticipate they are going to do um, and what are the potential hiccup that could carry out because these are the things that if we don't really physically run through when it goes wrong it's gonna be chaos you know um, people would not would not know what to do and we only have Chris in our team so Chris only have two hands and uh, he can only help one at a time. So, um, so definitely we need to familiarize uh, rise with it. Um, another part is technical support. <clears throat> so for the technical support is specifically for all the attendees. So Diane mentioned about prior, we sent out detailed instruction. It's not only for presenters, but for attendees and for our session chair and discussions, but also during live conference, People need instruction. Everybody come from different background in terms of their technological skills. So uh, people, most people perhaps not familiar with conference Zoom operations. So uh, here we want to share with you a little bit of our own breakout room instruction and sort of listen to what kind of uh, content that we talk about. All right. And Let's see if you can hear it. If not, that means I need to do something. So the second thing is about breakout room. So uh, for the breakout room, the presentation session are all located in breakout room. So imagine that is the physical room that you attend in a convention. And you are freely to select the breakout room you would like to enter or leave at any time to join a different sessions. And how do you do that? You click the breakout room. So the breakout room location is also on the bottom of your screen. There is an icon called breakout room. If you can see it, could you do thumbs up? Mm -hmm. No? Okay, so Chris is going to open the breakout room right now. If you can see it, 
thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so this is something later on you are going to use this breakout room to enter the room of your choice. And what room you would like, go to the symposium program, you'll be able to see it. The last thing I want to share is we have staff stationed in all sessions. Their names are listed in the program. So if you have any questions, you can go to the chat box and send a message to our staff stationed in the particular session. And now, because to help you put the face and their names together, I would like to introduce them. So um, if you are in the gallery session, you'll be seeing them on the top. So from the left side, uh, other than uh, we have Diane, Zach, and Grace. Next is Amanda Mohan. Thank you. Caitlin Z. Okay, so this is just a glimpse into what kind of instruction that we might provide it. As you see, I try to provide the instruction of breakout room. When I say thumbs up or thumbs down, you could see probably about half thumbs down, they can't find a breakout room. And we it, now it's still a mystery why some of them cannot find breakout room. Perhaps it's there, they couldn't find it. Or perhaps it's Zoom, is not their Zoom system is not updated. So uh, somehow they don't have that. But you could see that they definitely need the instruction. And for those thumb down later on, Chris spent a lot of time trying to transition them to the presentation room that they wanted to. And another thing is introducing the staff member. That is very critical. The reason is because once if they go into the presentation mode, you don't, if you have trouble, you have to know who you have to go to. And I was in charge of the main floor. I wouldn't be able to go to any, every session if people have trouble. So every single session, the staff, they need to be familiar with. So they saw the face. If they need to contact them, they just go ahead and chat. So um, introducing a staff is very critical. And another pre pre preparation that is very critical is the marketing part. So Diane is going to share with you about our marketing plan and action that we did. Um, certainly with the face-to-face -face symposium, we used a lot of technology with our marketing, a lot of social media, email, et cetera. But this was our only option um, during the pandemic. So we knew we needed to increase our marketing at the level of um, emails and social media. So we developed um, a flyer, an email banner, and a website along with our traditional um, email invitations that were sent to a very wide audience. Um, this slide um, shows you our um, flyer and our e email banner. Grace will move to that one. Um, the flyer, as you could see, was um, very well designed by one of our graduate assistants. Um, and this used to be posted throughout Cleveland State, um, sent to a number of other universities and locations. But um, we did, I think, a pretty good job of sending it out to our audience um, via email. And we were able to send it multiple times as well. So it had its advantages. Um, we give thanks to um, Dr. Buckley for the idea of an email banner. We had not used that in the past. Um, we developed this banner that um, Grace and I put at the bottom of every email we sent for about six weeks prior to the symposium. So anyone that we had contact with um, was able to learn about the symposium. So it was a new strategy that we learned and we would certainly use again. Um, another um, email marketing approach that we used was our invitation. Um, again, we had a lot of information um, on this to help people know what the symposium had to offer and to make it easy to participate. Um, certainly, it included the registration link um, for everyone to have. Um, who did we send it to? Um, we certainly sent it throughout Cleveland State. Um, we looked at professional organizations that all of the persons involved in the action research program were members or participants. 
um, we were able to reach out to statewide organizations and national organizations. Um, we were very happy with the response that people were willing to share this information. And of course, we used our personal connections. Um, we are very excited about the work of these researchers and this symposium. So we were happy to share it on a personal level and invite those persons to attend. Um, a new addition this year, as far as the web websites, was our CSU Action Research Program website. And we had always used the college website for marketing and advertising because people went to that very quickly. But we had the opportunity to develop um, a website particular to the action research program. So at the very opening of this website, we had the information on how to register for the symposium, um, information about uh, the program, um, attendees, presentations, um, everything that persons would need. But just like the recording of this session, um, the action research uh, website is going to continue. People could come back to the website. We have um, a great deal of helpful information about the action research project, um, about uh, prior projects and results, um, suggestions for going forward with your own research, uh, a question and answer interaction session, um, certainly a recognition of the Martha Holding Jennings Foundation, who sponsors each year this action research project. So we were glad to add that information as well. So we felt that this website was really a needed and probably overdue extension of the action research program um, that came as the result of this virtual symposium. Um, and now um, I introduced Carmen at the beginning, but we're very happy to have Carmen join us. Um, I'm always glad to have a must graduate join us, but she was a participant in the formal presentations and has some um, excellent um, ideas to offer to you. Carmen. All right, so uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, so uh, I was actually uh, drawn to the uh, virtual symposium because I actually saw it as an opportunity uh, to explore other topics that my peers were working on at the time, uh, as well as an opportunity to actually share my action research topic uh, with them. So I had approached the symposium with a set of expectations, and I can honestly say that I am thrilled that it surpassed each and every single one of them. So uh, I was actually also glad that the symposium organizers uh, made it uh, available virtually and uh, now had simply canceled it due to the uh, pandemic because it was an opportunity I definitely did not want to miss out on. Uh, now the topic for my action research, uh, I going to say anything else, uh, was actually incorporating educational learning platforms with their class instruction uh, to increase participation and academic achievement uh, in a uh, virtual educational setting. Uh, so there on the screen, you'll actually have the, uh, the question. So the uh, research was actually conducted within uh, a ninth grade uh, class uh, for modern world history. It was done completely virtual. Um, I know within the last month or so uh, of the study, the, uh, the group actually went hybrid, but even though it was hybrid, it was still fully virtual. All right, so, uh, the, one of the reasons why I asked, uh, well, the reason why I actually chose uh, the formal presentation format uh, in the symposium uh, was because it allowed me to present my research topic in more detail. And also while uh, presenting in the formal presentation format, it also allowed me to present uh, the data and the findings uh, from the initial study that was conducted previously. And it allowed me to make modifications for how I had approached the full study. And it also solidified my topic and allowed me to embrace it more fully and, move forward uh, with implementing the intervention and the full study. Uh, now the feedback that I had, uh, all right, so uh, right there on the, uh, the screen, you actually have uh, kind of like a little snapshot. Obviously this is not the only data that I actually collected, but just to give you a general idea. So uh, this information was from the unit that was covered for World War I. Uh, now the first column for every color is gonna be the uh, pretest and the second column is gonna be the post-test. So you can actually see that there is a significant increase in academic achievement, right? Uh, for the, uh, the graph that's on the right for participation levels, uh, you actually also see an increase uh, 
per class, as well the the highest increase, which was I, I was actually surprised uh, and glad at the same time for the first group. Uh, that was the morning group. So normally they were kind of still half asleep when they joined the class. So I was actually <laughs> glad to see that their participation levels, even though they're the first group of the day, significantly increased from the time uh, the study began from week one all the way up to uh, week 12. All right, so uh, right there also, I have uh, some sam uh, sample survey questions uh, uh, that I actually uh, gave to the scholars uh, in the study. Uh, so this is pretty much just to get an, a general idea as to, you know, uh, the, the kind of uh, technology that we're using, the hardware, whether it was a, a household uh, computer or it was provided from the school district, as well as their preference on uh, learning with these different uh, platforms, which uh, the three that were used were Kahoot, Nearpod, and Vocabulary. Uh, also, you see there, um, you know, uh, I had asked them to identify uh, their preference, whether they uh, were enjoyed more fully remote or a hybrid. So even though they were hybrid, they were actually still in the school and they were able to somewhat interact with uh, their peers, which a lot of them actually enjoyed that. And uh, so uh, the feedback for the symposium, I thought that was extremely important. The feedback that I received was positive and constructive. And uh, in order to maximize time for the other participants, since everybody had a specific amount of time uh, that they could use, uh, I had also created a Jamboard to collect additional feedback. Um, and the link for that Jamboard, as well as the PowerPoint presentation that, uh, that I had utilized was actually made available as, uh, to all the participants and the panelists at the conclusion of uh, my presentation. So the feedback that I received was extremely helpful. Um, because it allowed me to see the other avenues that I was able to direct my research, uh, such as dividing the data that was collected by uh, scholar demographics, as well as uh, the level of technological knowledge of the educators uh, and the uh, secondary institution uh, that was actually involved in my, uh, my action research. Uh, so participating in a virtual symposium, I can honestly say that, uh, you know, virtually, it allowed me to develop more confidence in uh, my ability to carry out an action research project uh, that can be meaningful in the educational sphere. All right, so one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons as to why I actually uh, chose that topic that I did regarding virtual learning was because not only was it relevant to the current situation with the pandemic, uh, but I also see it as a kind of a way to look forward, let's say those snowy days where educators and scholars are not able to actually be in the school building because of uh, inclement weather. So maybe, you know, this type of virtual learning uh, could actually be utilized rather than ha losing a, a full school day. All right, so uh, also participating in the symposium, uh, it allowed me to appreciate more the importance of sharing my work, right, as well as the importance of teamwork and receiving feedback from my peers as well as professors. Uh, Mrs. Corrigan has been helping me along the way and her support has been uh, absolutely instrumental uh, because she knew from the beginning how nervous I was with putting this action research together. And I can honestly say that uh, with the symposium along with Mrs. Corrigan's support, uh, you know, it has helped me solidify uh, the belief in myself that I was actually able to do this. Uh, also, I would actually like to point out um, the, uh, you know, the importance of the facilitators and the role of uh, the virtual symposium. So I am one that I begin to talk and I sometimes lose sense of time. Uh, so it was important for me to have that facilitator present, uh, not only to assist in directing uh, the conversation and monitor time, but it also kept all, all participants uh, focused on the angle of delivering the content of their active research topic, as well as receiving positive and constructive feedback. Um, one last thing to close off on uh, my thoughts on this is uh, when it comes to participating in a virtual event, uh, technology can actually be an issue uh, because it could sometimes be unpredictable as we all, we're all aware of. Uh, but what I most like about it is that it allows events like the symposium uh, to take place when holding it in person is actually not an option. Uh, so the one, thing, the one thing that I do not like particularly about virtual setting 
uh, is that participants have the option to actually turn their cameras off. Um, now, I did not experience this during the virtual symposium, uh, but mentioning it in a general construct. Uh, it is understandable that there may be reasons as to why uh, the choice is made to, uh, for deactivating uh, the cameras. Uh, but for me personally, when it gives me the impression, uh, it gives me the impression uh, that the individual is actually not paying attention. So I am one that I like to see faces uh, of those who I'm addressing. So it gives me a, you know, more of a personal experience. Thank you, Carmen. And I think Carmen is an excellent example of our formal presenters and um, what they had to offer to the symposium and what the symposium could offer to her. So thank you so much, Carmen. Um, I want to conclude and Grace will join in as well with some of our lessons learned, um, everything from our elements of success and benefits to some of the challenges that we experienced with the virtual symposium. And many of these we have listed already during this presentation, but just to go back and highlight a few of those. Um, First of all, it was certainly exciting to offer the symposium to a wide audience. Um, there are persons who are limited in um, attending physically, um, travel, parking, et cetera, time-wise to come to Cleveland State. And um, the virtual option invited many more people and offered an element of convenience that people commented on was very helpful. On a practical level, certainly the virtual symposium was a lower cost than the face-to-face -face symposium. And that's always... Um, worth considering. Um, but we really appreciated the amount of interaction that persons had in the virtual symposium. Um, people were very actively involved in all three options. Um, they wanted to give feedback and there was um, very deep and significant levels of discussion that went on. Um, people were brainstorming. Um, we lost the piece of that social interaction that people have, that presenters could talk to the presenter next to them or move over to a table of food or refreshments and um, engage in informal conversations that are often um, most productive. So we didn't have that level of interaction, but we had a high level of professional interaction that came by having um, the options of the presentations, but also the significant presence of CSU faculty as discussants and chairs, and also our um, CSU graduate and undergraduate um, students. Um, we had the option of the recording. People could go back to it. People were very creative, such as Carmen, who um, created her own Jamboard to invite uh, more feedback after the session. Um, we also had um, the PowerPoints online. Um, there, we had our CSU website and our action research website. So I think we extended the options for feedback and interaction far beyond a one-time event, which was um, exciting. Um, we talked about also that wider audience that we had that we were able to invite. And I think um, that was key to the feedback um, as well. Um, I don't want to lose track of things like the chat room that um, is offered um, virtually that people can interact. So many um, pieces that the technology offered um, that made the program successful. Um, but as you know, that technology was also our biggest challenge. Um, Grace went through um, a number of challenges that we were able to address beforehand and we did our best and um, we were highly successful. We did have one um, glitch with the breakout rooms with about um, 75 people trying to get into breakout rooms at one time. We realized about 30 people were lost in that process. And again, Chris Renison was with us and um, through Grace uh, being on the main floor and Chris, within a couple of minutes, we were able to get all of those persons into the breakout rooms. Um, we knew in advance that um, with over 75 participants, that's a wide range of technology skills, um, expertise with Zoom, expertise with breakout rooms, and also just glitches that happen. Who knows why, right? It's technology. But um, overall, um, those were handled um, very smoothly. 
Um, another benefit came in our evaluation process. Um, we often and um, had responses from the persons attending face-to-face, -face, both hard copy forms and online surveys. But with the um, virtual symposium, we had a much higher rate of response from both attendees and researchers, um, giving us feedback on the symposium itself, as well as the action research process. So Grace and I were very grateful for that. Um, if we look at the feedback on both of those surveys, um, over 90% of the respondents um, rated the symposium um, as a success. Um, the feedback they received as productive um, was rated as agree or strongly disagree to the positive impact of that. So we were excited to see that. And we'll certainly review all of those comments um, going forward. Um, Grace, did you want to add some thoughts about our lessons learned as well? Um, I think I'll just attend to the technology part. And because of the challenge of lack of experiences in hosting a conference online. So that part need to be mindful about number one, seek for technical support. And we are very lucky, like uh, Diane said, we found the best person whose name is Chris. And then also we need to plan, plan ahead of time and then anticipate what might go wrong. That will be something to think about. Um, another one is building the experiences that we lack of by rehearsal and rehearsal. Um, so these are things that we would recommend. And then the plus also I wanted to mention which virtual symposium in certain way is missing is the face-to-face -face interaction. But what we did was also in the breakout room, it's a group breakout room people go in, but after the event, we continue to open the breakout room so people can go into the breakout room and interact. And we offer that, but only one group that they decided to go into one room and then they had some chat that I don't know what they were talking about, but at least we had that opportunity for them. Diane? Um, so that concludes the ideas that we wanted to share with you. And certainly we welcome your questions and your thoughts. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions you have about conducting a virtual symposium or this one particularly and also um, suggestions for us going forward. So we are grateful that you are with us today, either uh, present now or um, viewing this recording. So thank you. I'm just gonna give a uh, round of applause as people think of questions and comments. So thank you, uh, Carmen, Diane, and Grace. And yes, we have time for questions and comments. So please ask away. I put my question in the chat, but I guess I'll just say it for the benefit of the recording too. Um, but one of the things that I love to hear about is when we set up these platforms and put so much thought and planning into them, this actually sounds like maybe there wasn't a lot of room for unexpected surprises, but I wonder if there was anything that you were pleasantly surprised about, maybe a presenter who used the platform in a way you weren't anticipating or, you know, participants like going into the breakout room and using it as an informal space. Was there anything that you were happy yet was unexpected? Uh, Diane, you want to The first thing ahead. I would say is that, oh, the first thing I would say is the flexibility of the presenters. And of course, these are researchers, they're teachers, right? And their first um, characteristic is flexibility for many of them. But there were some issues with technology that we mentioned. Um, the timelines were tight. Um, we wanted to be sure that even the last presenter in the group had time for feedback. So we needed to shuffle some things around, a presenter that was not able to attend, someone who switched to a different session. So I think a very positive outcome was that um, we noticed the flexibility and the enthusiasm of the presenters, their willingness to support each other, um, to make sure that each presentation um, received its full attention. Um, also, I want to mention something. The plus is because the regular traditional symposium, people come and go. So the, the, the build up of the synergy is not as strong 
like togetherness as strong as the virtual room where we put the group in different rooms. Because when they are there, they are interested, they stay for the throughout the 60 minutes. If they are interested, they join the other group and then create another sense of synergy also. So I see that part is a plus for the virtual symposium. Um, and then the, the hiccup part, I, I mentioned and Chris was one to save us is the entrance. <laughs> and that part totally unexpected that how could people don't know how to get into the breakout room and it happened and it happened one third of the people and we, it's still a mystery, but just as simple as that, you know, we, we had to do one at a time to problem solve. And if Chris were not there, I'm not sure how I can handle it. So thanks to you, Chris. Are there things you want to add up, Chris? I think you did a very fine job. I, all Me hitting admit to participants notwithstanding, I think even technical glitches became very easy to debug and solve on the fly because of how well thought the rest of the program was. Right. So even if I had the ability to kind of move people around because I knew where all the panels were, it was still juxtaposed to a very solid structure and a well thought plan. So when it came time for, you know, a, when it came time for like there were some people who didn't know how to get into their breakout room. And so there was a point at which we manually assigned the people who couldn't, you know, figure out where to go. There was that was still put on top of there are five breakout rooms that you can go to. You've seen them in your program. You've made perhaps a, already a selection as to which one you want to attend. You know, um, giving them the ability to go from one breakout room to another was something that you determined. And then therefore there was a switch, you know, made available in the breakout room for people to move around. So, you know, having someone who, who can do technological moderation, right, is always helpful because then the presenters can think about presenting you know, the people who are the hosts can think about hosting, but uh, in the end, it's it all works because it's got a solid foundation. Thank you, Chris. And I want to add on is you have to find the right person. So the person who just happened to talk, Chris, he talked about debug and to him, he is excited about problem solving. It's not when the problem come, oh, okay, I don't know what to do. No, he right get right into it. And you can see the eyes and the excitement he has. And that's what we need. So you need to find the right person. Okay. Thank you. Yes, we are very lucky uh, to have Chris on our team as well. Um, I had a question it sort of relates to two of the benefits, I guess, that you imagined. And I asked this from, as at least many of you know, I also host typically a face-to-face -face conference in March and we held a virtual event this year. But the um, your two comments about the ability to include more people easily and the idea of the higher response rate for evaluations, assessments. So moving forward, looking ahead, in what way do you think you might try to still allow for those things, although it sounds like you're maybe tracking towards um, some kind of face-to-face -face event in the future, how would you try to still let those things be alive and well? That's a very good question. Diane, you wanted to share? We had some thoughts right after the symposium. Exactly. We had some thoughts, just like I'm sure every other organization, school district, classroom teacher, etc. How do we take the best of what we learned at the symposium, as well as throughout the pandemic, and apply it going forward at every level of education? So um, initially, our thoughts are to return to the face-to-face um, symposium, um, symposium, but how do we offer an online option? You know, can we somehow record it? Can we somehow have, you know, just as in hybrid learning, teachers were teaching in their 
their classroom, but there are also students at home who are participating in those classes online. Can we um, have both platforms available at the same time? Um, that would be another learning curve for Grace and myself, but we're willing to try that. But um, I think we want to incorporate a higher level of technology and virtual participation than we had in the past. And also um, be able to encourage the completion of those surveys. Um, we need to work on that, Molly, because that is valuable information. And so how we offer that link, um, how we, um, we did offer some prizes this year. So that may be it, right? That uh, you're in a lottery if you complete the survey. So maybe by continuing that piece, um, we could get the higher level of participation. Um, I know, Grace, was there anything beyond those thoughts? I think to sum up, definitely, we hope to have blended options, but technically how to do it in a smooth way, that will be something to think about. But we see the 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 cream of the pie of both. So we are hoping to think about in that direction for future symposiums. Great. Well, we will keep talking. I, I know it's an ongoing conversation um, to figure out, even all of our professional conferences, right, are trying to find ways to still be hybrid or how to accommodate those given the cost of travel around the globe. So, um, and I did, I think Shelly's comment, we at a uh, campus, we had talked about doing surveys instead of the paper format. I think as a society, we have become more conditioned to a QR code and just saying yes, no, one, two. Um, so there may be ways to just quickly scan something and enter the responses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good idea. Great suggestions. Thank you. Yeah. Gosh, this uh, is amazing. Oh, sorry, Shelly. I know it's no, I, <laughs> I was just going to say, this is amazing. Thank you all for coming and sharing your experience because I'm in awe at how much you really plan this out to the smallest detail. And I think it's something we can all learn from. So I appreciated it very much. Thank you. Thank oh my you. God. Thank you so much for your time today and sharing part of your July with the Cleveland Teaching Collaborative. Um, so we look forward to posting this. And of course, if you have additional questions and comments, you know where to find us and you all can find each other um, in the Referatory or Gather Town any day this week. And we appreciate this opportunity that Carmen, Diane and I will be able to share and also like technology recording. So potentially you can pass on to share with other people too. We appreciate this opportunity. <laughs>